<laughs> All right. Uh, we will. Yeah, I'm going to delay and then echo. Anyway. All right. So I apologize in advance because I didn't realize that there would be first years potentially not knowing the method. So I haven't discussed the Vernadoc method in detail. Um, I'll maybe leave those details to come up. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk more about the purpose of Vernadoc and why, um, why we're doing it in Australia as we have done in with our colleagues from university and how the method is appropriate to the buildings that we're looking at here. Okay, so the opening screen here is our flyer that we post to our students, try and get them enthusiastic <laughs> about participation in this study tour. So first of all, I'd like to talk about a joint acknowledgement of country, which is something in Australia recognising owners. So I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Obviously we're meeting virtually, but I guess I'm speaking from myself and Darren's perspective and pay my respect to elders past and present. The land that I'm on at the moment is Ghana land, but the borough of Ernadoc that we did was on Nudgery land. So I'll explain more about the different Aboriginal groups in Australia, um, or relative to borough, shortly. Okay, so as you can see from this slide, this was the first Australian Bernadoc, with us or Indonesia or anywhere else at that point. And so we we're anticipating we would have our international colleagues joining us in from all over Indonesia, from Thailand, from Finland. This is our really um, uh, main enjoyment from the whole process. So, um, uh, so yeah, the flyer here advertises the context of an international context. Unfortunately, Barra Vernadoc went ahead only with the Australians because of um, the limitations on travel for everybody given, um, uh, given COVID. So this is, this is how we start anyway. Okay, now, so I want to talk about really the context of our um, study tour being, even though we were documenting a um, colonial heritage, a British colonial heritage, you can see from this drawing, it's stone and um, stone buildings with timber structure. Uh, we are very much working in the context of the Nudgery people. And this reference here uh, that I've included in the slide is a book dedicated to the, as it says, the Aboriginal people of the Mid-North region of South Australia. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that our study tour was heavily subsidised by the Regional Council of Goida. Um, so those, and then that's, uh, then we've also got our other partners here. Down the bottom, you can see the, uh, the um, branding, um, Nudgery Nation, Blackwood Heritage Consulting, Goida, UniSA Creative, Vernacular Knowledge, and of course, University of Indonesia supporting this talk. All right, so 
So first of all, I want to talk about, um, again, sort of following on from my earlier talk that I gave to University of Indonesia last week, um, about the ideas of representation. And in this case, we're revisiting the mining vernacular uh, in Bara, uh, which has uh, its own narrative in historical terms. And I'm going to spread in the Nudgeri Aboriginal um, narrative as well. So um, according to the um, elder that we worked with, Quentin Ages, he believes that the colonial architecture is another, another layer of history because his people have been in this country um, ancestrally for up to 60,000 years, thereabouts. Uh, and so the settlers or European settlers that came to Burra, South Australia, have another history. So this is a very much, that's why the talk is titled Shared Heritages. There's also a story that a Nudgeri boy um, actually found copper in the region, the metal, copper, the metal um, from which Burra became famous for in its mining heritage. Um, and he, this boy approached the new settlers to Burra and showed them what was available in, you know, in a particular location. That's according anecdotally to history. This is not really written into the history books. Also, um, so I'll just shift to show you where Barra is relative to Australia, for example. Okay, so we've got here Australia and we're um, in the bottom, where the southern, southern, the southeastern side of Australia, um, Adelaide, and you can hear, see this map here. And then Red Banks is the conservation park, which Quentin took our students to, to contextualize how land was before white settlement. And then um, Barra is further located to the north of Red Banks. And the dotted area is Nudgery land. And this map next to the, the uh, in more detail, showing the place names, this depicts Nudgery land. So um, the base sort of understanding of Barra in historical terms is that it's renowned for predominantly copper mining and it's a Welsh and Cornish mining settlement uh, settled in the 1800s. There was also large scale pastoralism and all of this uh, displaced Nudgery peoples to quite um, far, uh, far away in that sense is that they went to places like, um, which you can't actually see on this map, on the other side of the um, Spencer Gulf, uh, they went to the York Peninsula, uh, which is, um, became a mission, Christian mis mission. So Aboriginal people from various language groups were resettled in Point Pierce. And so the long-term effects of this displacement is one of the concerns is why we wanted to document um, Burra and its history and its Nudgery history in addition to the mining history. Okay, so also another, I'll just um, show you some of the landscape that was surrounding and still is, is still surround Farah. You can see quite contrastingly to Indonesia, it is a very dry landscape, arid landscape <clears throat> with, with um, uh, a lot of grasslands and low shrubs. So um, the way, so with the Aboriginal people being displaced from their land, it meant that uh, they only could, uh, because what, Aboriginal people refer to as a connection to country is very intrinsic in the way they understand the world. Like, so the only way of understanding their original lands was to uh, recall it through dreaming stories. Now, this is this 
<clears throat> dreaming stories are these uh, stories that convey con complex relationships between peoples of Nudgery country um, from the evolution of specific land formation of rivers. So they explain landscape through these dreaming stories. They also tell the, the people that are um, listening to the story, what is the moral behavior of the community? And they're typically discussing spirits, animal incarnations, and that are metaphorical, but also literal. Now, many of these stories, even today in the 21st century, haven't been published or recorded by anthropologists because they're culturally sensitive. Um, and therefore, they shouldn't be accessible to anyone that is not within the language group, and then also not accessible even to different genders. So male and female stories are often separate. Okay, so um, the work that we have drawn upon to look at this uh, cultural heritage or intangible cultural heritage comes from a scholar called Claire Smith. She's based here in Adelaide at Flinders University. And she talks about, she's done a lot of uh, research on Nudgery people. And she talks about uh, these particular sites that we've been looking at, in particular Red Banks Conservation Park. And she says that the first real contact that Nudgery had with Europeans was in 1840. And it was around the time when they were uh, undertaking large scale farming. And, and then when they found copper, or however they found copper, um, they established a really large mining community in Barrow, and which had a major impact on the nudgery. And it meant that with this huge influx of white settlers that um, through and, and the production of road networks and farming, it meant that disease and um, displacement of Nudgery, the Nudgery community um, occurred on a sort of wholesale uh, scale. So that's when um, the missionaries opened up Point Pierce and uh, the, the Nudgery elders and their community went there. Another reason we're looking at Borough in this context is that the Borough Charter is, I hope, <laughs> an internationally recognised document um, around places of cultural significance, which was a leading document uh, in its time. Um, the recent, the most recent version is 2013, but many international heritage experts are familiar with the Borough Charter, but no one seems to know, other than Australians in particular, where Borough is. Even Australians struggle with that. So we decided that it makes sense to start the first uh, Australian Vernadoc in the home of the Borough Charter. So uh, this image here, is how we kind of started my colleague, Darren Fong, who's also on this Zoom. Uh, and I started looking at sites through firstly laser scanning to see what those sorts of representations re revealed around the sites and also to think about how we might do a Vernadoc um, on these, under these conditions. <laughs> Quite different to the sites we'd looked at in um, Indonesia. So there was a few um, objectives that I also men mentioned in my other talk around the Arche House um, and the aims that we were trying to achieve with that documentation process. So this particular one is also about archiving um, and recording local building types. 
social histories, and then of course, always disseminating this knowledge to a global audience. Also reconnecting with vernacular knowledge to teach students how to build in stone for, con uh, for conservation purposes and learning old techniques. The way of building as is the case often with Indonesian architecture, this way of building isn't commonplace anymore. The trades people and crafts people that were involved in this style of building are difficult to come across. And so we feel it's a really useful um, exercise to draw these buildings so our students understand their construction and how perhaps if they turn into heritage architects, they might go about conserving these sorts of um, structures. And of course, as I've um, illuminated so far, the reference to connecting Nudgery and non-Aboriginal histories hasn't really taken place in Burrow. And I also mentioned that the Barrow Bar Charter is really significant and so therefore identifying the place of where the Charter was signed. And also, and finally, we also work with um, trades, uh, trades um, such as stonemasons from Heritage Stone Restoration to teach students um, that traditional mode of building. All right, so getting onto the specifics of uh, Borough Verdadot, how we started, um, apart from the, myself and Darren undertaking sort of the site analysis to see which uh, buildings to draw, we decided that we would go with um, uh, uninhabited buildings. And I did allude to some of this uh, information in my last talk. Uh, around the complexities of drawing residential architecture in Australia and uh, is that we felt that to draw public buildings was more feasible, <laughs> let's say. Okay, so we started our whole um, Vernadotte camp with Quentin, he's in this picture, uh, and he's doing a welcome to country and we started out at Red Banks Conservation Park, which is um, his ancestral lands, as is Borough um, Township. But we started in a place where there was a lot of an, there, there was a natural environment. Um, so uh, again, coming back to this idea of conceptualizing and rethinking the vernacular that I also spoke about previously. This is really this form of engagement uh, and a mode of learning and understanding the vernacular through participating in traditions. And this is a tradition, um, a welcome to country. So this is a type of knowing that is brought about not just through the drawing and representation, but also through being in the field and participating in cultural um, ceremonies. Okay, so part of that means, uh, in this case, or it doesn't mean, but this is what I elected to do because every time I've done a Bernadoc previously, it was overseas and I didn't have my family with me. So um, I happened to bring along my family, or well, some of them, I've got more kids, but <laughs> I only brought two, the boys. Um, and so they got to experience some of the landscape, they're quite familiar with Burra because we used to go camping there a lot, but um, they got to see kind of what I do and what I'm passionate about uh, in terms of uh, documenting cultural heritage. And they met Quentin, which was one of the highlights definitely for them. So we have our students, so you can see here on the left hand side or the top image is the uh, colonial kind of heritage buildings and I'm in the, the foreground just counting who what students <laughs> are there and then on the right hand side we're at Barry Gorge and looking listening to Quentin's stories around the landscape so this is all very much part of the process I will get to the drawings don't worry 
but I want to introduce the process because it's really important uh, that underpins Vernadoc and the experience of site. So here are my boys here again. Um, we're exploring and rolling down the cliff faces, uh, scaring all my students that they were going to come to a terrible end at the bottom of the valley. Um, and But it's really about illustrating the sort of holistic holistic way we approach these sorts of drawing camps because unless you understand the environment and the um, in this image you can see there's a lot of erosion occurring in the cliff faces so the environment is quite harsh um, but this is sort of the landscape that Quentin in particular is very interested in regenerating uh, and this is something we'd like to look into for future Vendocs, is how we can give back something to not just the community, but the actual environment, um, perhaps by um, native vegetation reinstatement or something like that. Okay, onto the drawing. Now, I am just going to show you a series of drawings, and I'll just move the... Um, uh, a series of drawings that were done by our students. It was quite a small group, this time by comparison to our international uh, camps. I think we ended up having 28 people drawing. And this is a site section to show um, the kind of uh, extent of the site that we drew. These engine towers are um, were part of the working mine, but to the, the image to the right, you can see that it's a ruin effectively, and the compound adjacent to the Morfitt engine tower, which is at the left-hand side of the screen, is uh, also kind of ruinous um, buildings still. So we were, so these were not, they're not inhabited buildings, but it was um, it was still quite a challenge to draw um, up to four stories in using this method. So you can see here again the site context. It's quite a sloping site. This was quite a challenge as well for students to use our, if I say, sort of an ad hoc <laughs> triangulation method to understand the topography because yeah the drop across the site was quite substantial so this is the sort of um, site profile now you get getting to see some of the detail of the stonework and the uh, sort of complexity of the buildings um, these were so each just to quickly explain the method in a very brief uh, way for those that don't know each student does one projection so this projection is the south elevation and uh, this was done by one student but everyone has to share their knowledge talk about the different measurements trying to get the in particularly in these buildings the stonework to match up when you move around the building considering the next elevation is done by somebody else. So it was a big task. And um, this particular student ended up producing a really nice drawing, despite having to redo the part of the inking actually quite a number of times. So I thought I would show this as a sort of a success story <laughs> after he struggled somewhat. Now, because of the size of the buildings and the size of our paper, we and we were drawing using the Vernadoc scale of one to 25, we had to split the uh, sections and side elevations across two people. So the challenge then is you can see that there are some discrepancies here in the drawing where the shadow is slightly deeper on one side than the other. Um, so not always did the, and then the intensity of the hatching is, diff is different. But 
Um, and there's also where you can see that this sort of swirly tie, this is a metal uh, steel tie, um, wall tie, tying the uh, stonework together. This is the sort of point of overlap of the drawings. So these, there's not two tires here, they should sit over the top of each other. So that's how uh, we got around the width of the, the drawings. But anyway, they turned out really nicely. These are A1 more or less size, these drawings. And then here's a section, again, the, uh, Two people are doing one section uh, through the building and then they have to make it link up. So these guys worked really hard to uh, finish these drawings because there was a lot of measuring across the three stories in section and to understand the construction. So uh, it was quite a big challenge. Oh, now can I also just draw your attention to the stance? So always with our uh, Thai colleagues who introduced us to this method, there is a sort of referencing of who was involved in, in the actual drawing camp. And so here we've got our red stamp, which is our Australian Vernadoc uh, logo. We've got our research group and the university. So on, um, I'm sure Prof Kemas will elaborate further on his, um, his individual stamping method for the project, for his project. Okay, now to come back to this idea of, whilst I've just been showing you the British heritage of Byron in terms of the Welsh and Cornish um, mining, I want to come back to this idea of how these images uh, and deliberately so, uh, overlaid the British heritage, the mining heritage, here with an image of Quentin talking to the students about connection to country, about his um, dreaming stories, and about his knowledge of the place that is part of his also shared history. And and these talks that Quentin is giving in the context of Barrow Vernadoc is really important because it uh, presents a totally different perspective of uh, who occupied this land and, um, and how it's sort of a contested space still. Because a lot of Nudgery do not live in um, Borough. They live predominantly in other parts of South Australia, but um, their the main, uh, I guess, congregation is at that point up here. So in, in not just measuring and, and drawing, we're also experiencing a kind of intangible cultural heritage that is really what the borough charter talks about. But interestingly, borough's intangible heritage has not been recorded because it's a lot easier to document uh, a building than it is to document a history that is um, sometimes controversial, sometimes not acknowledged or sometimes can't be shared because of the reasons I was mentioning earlier around cultural sensitivity. Now, um, this is a one drawing that one of our students, Anastasia, did. She was also involved, um, she was a veteran in Bali Vernadoc, from Bali Vernadoc. And she was one of the group leaders of which we had three group leaders, I think. Um, and when I say group leaders, she was helping students on the ground in Australia. At the same time, she was helping our virtual students, which were from University of Udayana, um, we from Ibu Angi's 
uh, student cohort. And this is the first time we have ever trialed trying to draw remotely. It's something that would be very interesting to explore with University of Indonesia. Um, since uh, Prof Kemas host his um, on the ground, Bernadoc. Um, yeah, so it would be something to talk about and we'll get back to that. Okay, so this is Anastasia's drawing. The idea is that she instructs her colleagues in Bali through WhatsApp, through Zoom, we had some Zoom meetings, um, how, how, to, and how to do these drawings based on her measurements. Now, this, these were not easy buildings to draw, so this was a huge task. I'll come back to that shortly. Okay, so here we have another section through the engine tower. And um, again, paired with that, we have the scar tree. And there, the scar tree is this um, massive river red gum uh, tree located at Barrow Gorge. And one of my students is in front of it photographing um, one of the elders who is explaining what the significance is of this tree and why it must be uh, protected cultural heritage. Now, some of the reasons behind that was related to, you can see in the back of the tree, there's this sort of, uh, um, I don't know, elliptical shape. These, these shapes uh, have been cut out of the tree by Aboriginal people to make um, these big timber bowls called coolamans. And they are um, made for various purposes, typically by the men, and they are used in different cultural ceremonies, but they are also um, uh, used for everyday purposes as well for carrying things and storing things. The tree itself is completely burnt out in the middle and the tree can shelter and has sheltered Aboriginal people that have moving from one place to the other. So these are just one form of structure in um, in this part of the country. Different structures were utilised by different Aboriginal groups across Australia, depending on what kind of uh, environmental support there was for their community. So that might have been caves, it might have been the desert, and so they might have needed to construct their own structures. So yeah, this is just one example in this part of the world. So again, this kind of relationship between a structure of Aboriginal people, which is a living structure, um, the tree, versus the European settlement structure. So this idea of shared heritage is clearly not new. Um, this is why I wanted to draw your attention as well to this particular reference. Uh, which is got a chapter in it by um, Professor Claire Smith, who I mentioned before, who's an archaeologist, and talks specifically around um, Nudgery shared heritages and uh, and knowledge, like how how this sort of knowledge sharing between non-Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people uh, might take place. And then uh, here we've got another drawing of one of uh, the, the ground floor plan of the uh, engine tower. Now you can see how substantial uh, this sort of construction is in terms of its uh, stonework. So building on, excuse the pun, the uh, ideas of Claire Smith, uh, this project or this documentation of Barra mine site is part of our, one of our projects called co-mapping knowledges. And we're working again with Nudgery Nation and Quentin 
uh, to utilize a sort of theoretical lens of critical heritage studies uh, coupled with social justice research. Um, specifically, we refer to Claire Smith and one of another Nudgery elder called Vincent Copley, uh, understanding of or a conceptual notion called intellectual soup. Now, you may wonder what this has got to do with Bernadotte, but uh, all of this documentation is part of a bigger sort of project around trying to understand the history of this part of the world. So this idea of intellectual soup means our ideas are forming part of that history, Nandri Nation ideas are forming part of that history, the drawings are contributing, and our conversations and engagement with Aboriginal people and borough, other borough community members informs that history. So I guess even as architects, we can't look at a building and just dissociate it from its environment, from its cultural context. Uh, we need to understand all these things to understand how that building came about and how appropriate or how it might be useful in the future for adaptive reuse purposes. So now I'm just going to quickly show you our version of an ex our exhibition, quite small scale by comparison to our bigger camps that we've been involved in in Indonesia. But it, importantly, it was launched by the smoking ceremony. So hopefully this works, this video works. I was so worried about the drawings <laughs> burning. So that was Quentin. Um, he said, when I asked him, what are you doing? The smoke alarm's going to go off. <laughs> he said, I mean, I knew what he was doing, but I, um, this is the kind of, again, this shared coming together of the exhibition of mining history, being in a heritage listed building, um, opened by an Aboriginal elder from the region and doing a smoking ceremony, which is just not allowed in heritage buildings. <laughs> so it's really interesting that uh, all of these kinds of uh, relations came together in this space. So it was a really, he felt, it was really interesting. He felt really empowered by the experience as I think all of the students and we did. Okay. So some still images just quickly of the exhibition. So these are the drawings um, on, uh, presented on the drawing boards that we were using, um, the very um, rudimentary MDF that we got our workshop guys or Darren organized for our workshop guys to cut up for our drawing boards. So the exhibition see is um, in this town hall, but it got, um, this is just the beginning before the community came on board, the students were all looking at their work proudly. And um, yeah, the, we, it's a real celebration of these shared heritage ideas. So again, in the same way that I was speaking about the Arche House and its history, uh, this kind of passage that I've put here uh, really applies to Barra as well, and that without explaining to local people or, or um, retelling the story, because the story gets lost in historical context, especially if the story is potentially con um, uh, not confrontational but um, problematic, uh, is that 
it actually empowers local people with a connection to their landscape and their history. So we really believe that through this work um, that we're sort of promoting a different way of seeing or a different way of kind of coming together and uh, trying to put aside past prejudices to rethink how um, even the documentation of col colonial heritage can be interwoven with uh, the Aboriginal story. So here's another sort of overlay here of this another scar tree, which is actually um, on the left. Uh, that image is really such a massive issue at the moment for Aboriginal people from this part of the world. Uh, the, star tree, the scar tree is located right next to a campground and uh, campers have been cutting the tree, which is in the bottom right hand corner, you can see there's this cut, which is a chainsaw mark of somebody who doesn't understand the significance of this tree, cutting it for firewood. Now, this is a really old tree. It's actually dead now. Um, but again, it has so many stories, so many culturally sensitive um, issues around it. And it's not being preserved. So these are kinds of things that are happening in this part of the country. Now, just quickly, some more images that I've shown you, some of those sections. And now, this is one of the drawings from one of our virtual students, which was who I was speaking about before, was uh, instructed by Anastasia. This is uh, Poultry's work um, from Udayana. And uh, this was what I think is a really interesting opportunity in the future to explore for all our vac vernacular knowledge um, partners to see how in case uh, we cannot travel in the near future, what we can do to start working together again in this format. And I guess uh, the webinars is, is a great start, um, but yeah, how can we actually get our students involved in uh, collaborating, co-collaborating across these issues of a pandemic so lovely drawing by Poultry. Okay, now this is a final video. I've got a couple more slides after this, but um, that's it. But this is a final video just to sort of sum up what one of our students thought, because this is one of the submission criteria. So I thought it might be interesting to hear his views from your perspective. Hi, this is James, and this is the initial thoughts and introduction to oh, my Vanderlock experience. Blurry, sorry. So, just going to run some thoughts off the top of my head, how I'm feeling and what I'm expecting. Oh. So, I'm feeling pretty positive and I'm feeling excited, although I'm a little bit worried about the workload, as I've heard that this is one of the more intense study tours that people go on. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's basically how I feel about it. Hang on um, a sec. I, I might just... Um get out of this if I can and see if I can get the video to work better on here. Hi, this is James. Now, can, this hang is on, sorry. I might have to reshare. My... Sorry, guys. Bear with me. Now, let's see if this works better. Uh, oops, wrong sharing screen. <laughs> Just. Hi, this is James, and this is the uh, actual- Musab, can you see that? No. No. <clears throat> no. no. Okay, hang on. <clears throat> So, Stop sharing again. Sorry. Just going to run some thoughts off the top of my head. How I'm feeling. Take your time. <laughs> I am. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Um, stop share. Come back to me. Okay. Let's see. This works. 
Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, still positive, a bit blurry. Excited, although I'm a little bit worried about the workload, as I've heard that this is one of the more intense study tours that people go on. Um, so yeah, that's basically how I feel about it. Um, my thoughts are that I have everything I need. I'm pretty sure that there's a stationary store and a hardware store. So if I need anything or if my tape measure breaks or if I need a new set of pencils or anything like that, it should be okay. Um, apart from that, I think I'm prepared mentally. I'm excited for the challenge. I'm excited to learn. And from my understanding, Barra is a um, pretty nice town. There should be a lot of things to go see and discover. So yeah, and also excited that this is going to be the first Australian Bernadoc. So that will also be very interesting and a very valuable thing to be able to do. So yeah, this is the first journal of five. So stay tuned. I hmm. experience I've chosen. I just the, cut into a few of them. Um, group trip to Red Banks Conservation Park and the World's End Campground. This was in the second week. So this experience was done as a group. We went and met at the World's End Campground. And at that place, we met with Quentin. And Quentin is an ind indigenous Nigeri native who's very familiar with Nigeri dreamtime stories and culture. And he explained a bit about his understanding of the land and his relationship to it while we were there. And that was also very interesting. So yeah, that was definitely a highlight of the trip, I'd say, getting up. Okay. Um, and then that, and I'm just jumping a little bit. I think, I think it's definitely broadened our uh, understanding of the town and what some of the significance of particular um, sites and monuments mean. Thank you. That was my mm -hmm. take over growing it being a pretty common place practice in pre CAD times, but I didn't really know how um, effective the outcome really could be and how um, precise you could really make those drawings, especially when documenting a pretty decrepit uh, old building, not to criticize it, but to just, you know, note how this is something I guess you would only really be able to pick up on lasers quite accurately. Um, but I think this method really does capture it well. And, you know, if you're in a country where um, you don't have the privilege of having easy access to CAD software, I think this is a, a really suitable and effective um, alternative. So, in that, um, um, go to cafes or um, a door join or something, something technical like that. Um, but no, it definitely helped pick up the mood and boost the morale. So Thank you. definitely see the value in having a bit of time to, I guess, go out and talk to the people you're on the trip with and boost some of the energy and spirits that you might lose when dealing with some of the challenges that the vernacular documentation style definitely uh, is riddled with. And <laughs> it's that concludes that. Thank you. All right. Okay, I'll stop share that, and I've just got a couple more. Um, I hope you found that amusing. <laughs> Riddled with <laughs> what on earth does he mean? Um, okay. All right. So, oh, oops. Sorry. Oh, it's way. Oh, so that was it. <laughs> So I'm summing up with James's comments. Okay, well, I'd just quickly like to add that <laughs> that um, whilst the, a lot of students did find the process very challenging, uh, particularly the size of the buildings and um, the weather was crazy. <laughs> the weather was torrential rain. Um, here we're telling them we're doing it in the Australian arid desert pretty much as it rained and then it rained for the whole first week almost 
um, and the wind was huge. So you couldn't really go outside with your drawing boards except for early in the morning. Um, so there were some big challenges for the students. So I guess that is <laughs> James's comment. Um, but I think on the whole, the final feedback was it was really worth it. And they particularly enjoyed Quentin's um, input. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Julie, for your uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, and I'm learning that uh, we are reminded about this uh, vernacular documentation technique that also facing uh, limitations and uh, challenging conditions. Uh, and that's what it called as Fernadap, right? Uh, because no, because uh, no or uh, limited choices are provided, like what uh, your lecture uh, had taught us uh, in the previously that the tradition is the the absence of choices. So uh, we should be uh, doing what we can do in the more uh, limited uh, situations with somehow uh, limited uh, tools as well. Right. So uh, thank you, Julie. And now uh, we are coming to Professor Kemas Ridwan Kurniawan as the second uh, lecture and uh, slide presentations. And we would love to see more uh, notable examples of uh, the drawings and the practice of uh, vernacular documentation in Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, we had started that. Uh, previously in the first lecture of Julie Nichols when doing in Aceh, but we will expect to see more uh, from uh, the activities of Fernando in Muntok Bangka. Yeah, Prof Kemas, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Prof Kemas, the time is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you Musab, and thank you Julie for very, very good uh, uh, presentations. Uh, before I start, maybe I would like to share a video. Can anybody see the screen? Yes, Prof, it's already there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I think uh, Julie presentation is really uh, explain a lot about uh, Venadoc aspect. So it's make me easier <laughs> uh, not talking a lot uh, about Venadoc uh, philosophy. Uh, and I saw some of the participants coming from international participants and some from uh, Indonesian Fernando and most the participant from uh, new students from uh, basic design one. So for this presentation, I try to uh, suit with these conditions, not only for uh, talking about the Fernando, but try to switch with the uh, the educations about the drawing the function of the drawing as a tool for communications and how the vernacular architecture being communicates through drawings uh, so it's it's edits uh, continue from what julie has been explained before and part of the presentation has been presented a few months ago with uh, Pusat Dokumentasi Arsitektur. So I just try to uh, combine it with the uh, Bangka Venadoc 2, which is uh, done last year in Chinese mayor house uh, in Mun Muntok, West Bangka. So uh, for the student who just know the word vernacular yeah, maybe for the veteran it's already uh, known about the the etymology of vernacular so it's come from the latin vernaculus belonging to the household or talking about the domestic native and there is sense of operations uh, but in the when it this term being used for architectures it seems to me it's uh, talking about the the other, the architecture that not being uh, in the mainstream of architectural history. It can be ordinary building, uh, very, very simple uh, building like uh, what Julie Nichols explained. I think it's very interesting show the the dilapidated of the 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 thin my uh, the 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 minings yeah, in Bura, which is now not become the, uh, the center of attention after being left for many years. And this is the idea of vernacular architecture. So, and for today, I would like to talk more focus about Banka Fernando one and two. And for those who never know about uh, Muntok, it is located in Bangka Island, in Tin Mining Island. And this city, this town is uh, become the center of smelting, tin smelting since colonial century. And most of the building in the town become the, the heritage of the tin mining. And in the past, Muntok become uh, the capital city of the Bangka resident, but since 1913s, uh, it left as only the as a, the headquarter for the tin mining uh, administrations, and the capital city moved to Pangkal Pinang. From Jakarta by plane, uh, it's about uh, 50 minutes. Yeah, and from Pangkal Pinang to Muntok, uh, you have to take car about three hours. Yeah, maybe uh, the the Bangka veteran Fernandok experienced this journey <laughs> yeah. from from Jakarta to Muntok, and then uh, because of the uh, the colonial process and the tin mining activity, and there is a unique characteristic of the town itself. And it, it's divided into several enclaves, which we call as a European cluster, Malay cluster, Chinese cluster. And 
This is the locations for the Bangka Fernando Puan in Kampung Ulu. Yeah, this is the the locations of the one of the oldest Malay village in Muntok. And the second one, Bangka Fernando II. This is uh, the Chinese mayor uh, in Muntok, one of the the most important Chinese mayor in the region at that time. And Bangka Fernando one, we did it in 2018. Yeah, and at that time we have 20 participants from Indonesia, Thailand, and Laos. We choose the sites of Kampung Ulu because of these sites, not only the oldest Malay Kampung in Muntok and the unique characteristics of the, the, the Kampung, but because of the area in danger due to flooding. It is located adjacent to the river Muntok, which experience uh, floodings almost every year. So, the heritage in this kampung then become uh, uh, threatened by environmental uh, uh, disaster. And when we talk about kampung, yeah, the existence of kampung or village in Muntok that has been recorded since uh, pre-colonial era and during colonial era, the, the establishment of Kampung were established to ease the administrative process of the colonial. And there are several uh, interesting characteristics of the Kampung compared to European or Chinese that's in Kampung, uh, it was characterized by the natural and transient environment more nature, more tree, yeah. and the material of the houses is made from uh, mostly from wood or from natural material. Yeah. And this is an old sketch from a uh, Dutch traveler uh, showing the Ume Banka, the vernacular architecture of the native built in a uh, uh, wooden frame. Uh, three back walls and touch roof. And these people live in agriculture and nomad, nomadian lifestyle. But nomadian lifestyle, uh, I think it's not uh, become uh, the habit anymore today. Yeah. And Malay also showing the the indications of uh, hybrid uh, influence yeah, because of they are located in the uh, the town of Muntok was located on the uh, beach and uh, become the uh, one of the important trading trading port yeah, on the uh, Bangka Straits yeah. and. When we talk about uh, Kampung Ulu, so this is the Kampung that uh, have many Malay architectural uh, houses that still exist until today compared to other Kampung. So it is why that the significance of Kampung Ulu in these studies because of the number of houses is uh, quite large, but the area threatened by environmental uh, 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 disaster almost every year. So we we need to to document, to drawing, yeah, to to record, yeah, the the existence of this house. So uh, the drawing here functions to communicate and to record uh, the existing house. So when the house being uh, wiped out sometimes by uh, by flooding or destroy, collapse by uh, flooding. So we have record to build it. They built it again. And this is the typology of the, uh, the Kampung Ulu uh, 
the, the environmental section of the Kampung Ulu drawing what, by one of the Bangka Fernando and showing that uh, the house is located near the, the river. Yeah. And this is the house that uh, we, we draw as, uh, as the object. And this is one of the, the left of the uh, vernacular Malay architectures belongs to uh, the leader of the kampung. Yeah. And this is two houses that we recorded, we drawn, and we will see how the impact of environment to this uh, building and how drawing draw uh, important roles in to save, yeah, to save this this building. And I think similar with Julie that we start from uh, making zero line yeah and using a water filled clear house and this i think it's it's very basic uh i think this is very basic uh methods yeah before uh architecture or architects start drawing so this is like old school uh methods but being uh reapply again here and I think this is important for the student today to know these methods, not only from the digital, but from the manual. Yeah. And, and then this is the process to make uh, zero lines, 1.5 meter from the grounds. And then uh, this is also the most important part in the process uh, layouting yeah and how to fit the object into the paper yeah. so this discussion is required to ensure paper size is suitable for the object and to achieve a uniform layouts between drawings yeah. very simple and we discuss with the team uh, and draw on the sands so this is very practical and on-site process. Yeah. And then we do uh, pencil sketch matching. Yeah. Object are measured using various tools to determine and positions again the zero line marks. The the problem with the vernacular architecture because of uh, the conditions of the building, it's not very precise like modern building some of the building uh, becomes have the, the angle and not straightforward so we have to use different tools to make sure uh, our drawing accurate so we have to to look at because uh, this malay house made by woods and it's uh, and it's almost 100 year old and we have to be careful and this house uh, one being uh, still being occupied by the owner and the other being left four months because the the owner uh, passed away several months before we start the uh, the the process yeah and also uh, after doing pencil, uh, the next is uh, try to convert yeah, the, the pencil drawing into the inking. And we set up the, the inking studio in one of the tin mining facility. And I think this is important uh, process for the student to know yeah, how uh, the, the drawing then take into the, its form. Yeah. I think similar with Julie that, uh, and this example how from the reality into drawing. So it's quite the, uh, the, uh, the, the upside down process yeah. if if 
architects design something yeah so they have to draw it and then uh, make it real but for fanadoc it's it's uh, not like that yeah is the building is already there and we redraw it again into the proper way so uh, apologize for the quality of the the picture because of the i think it's the scan yeah it's not very clear but the 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 original drawing is in uh, i think it's in 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 very very good uh, uh, quality drawings yeah and for fanadoc this is important to show uh, how the people live yeah how we record and understand uh, the process of the people who live here and their everyday life and how the constructions of the building yeah. all the the things uh the process of drawings involving rethinking not only doing the 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 drawing but when the stu uh, the 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 participants make a drawing yeah, they have to read things they have to thinking about what being inside there and what happened there and a lot of things then going on during this process and this is the real problems on the Banka Fenadok one uh, sites that the village face frequent floods floods and i think this is this is important to uh, how then uh, this give a benefit yeah, for the city for the kampung for the uh, urban uh, society yeah and the other problem is decaying structures most of because of the buildings made from wood and are prone to humidity and bugs and on the other hand the new materials and and the original materials are very expensive to revitalize yeah so wood is very expensive and house oftentimes are not occupied and left empty or too damaged to fix then replace with a brick structure so this is indications that uh, the the process of changing happen yeah so when we talk about fanado we we have to deal with the uh, the change yeah on the uh, architecture itself and what we record is the existing yeah uh, the conditions of the the building at the time precise when we record it yeah if the broken windows yeah, we have to draw it as as, bro uh, as a broken windows yeah windows as broken windows broken roofs collapse yeah so we have recorded yeah so it's it's important process i think it's in the process of recorded the vernacular yeah this is why we we call it as vernacular yeah and the other uh, importance role of the drawing that's uh, documenting history and the past yeah so how to document from story to pens yeah and we ask uh, the participant perspective after the workshop that all the participants had developed an attachment to the building and the city itself learning and acknowledging the community the current struggles and glories in the past that help participants value their surroundings architectural heritage so this is some of the result that uh, the participants uh, interest driven from uh, interest and love to draw in general i think this is good so we cannot push the participants to involve because fanadoc needs patience to do this and we cannot push the participants yeah to to join whether they do not have uh, patient about that and some answer to obtain class credits in heritage study i think this is interesting <laughs> uh, part of the process of uh, educations and the other say purely out of curiosity and excitement of a new experience yeah so and this is 
uh, before the workshops, yeah, before the workshop. But after the workshops, yeah, they they change yeah, the mind and value, uh, give up more appreciations, yeah, give more appreciation to to what we call as vernacular uh, architecture itself. So from not know to be know, yeah, to be uh, to know, yeah. And during the workshop. I think some. I think it uh, takes more two weeks to finish the drawings, and it's not only about drawing, but how to interact with the local people, the native. And for the Bangka Fena Dog one, we did uh, we use the uh, junior high school, one of the junior high school class, as our studio, inking studio, and. We involve uh, with the children, the teachers on the school, and we got a lot of information and knowledge. And I think this is part of the process of cultural sharing, cultural exchange with the local and know the local and appreciate the local people. Yeah, and and even uh, our. Uh, uh, Thai Fanadoc friends give lecture to the children of the school about the the culture of the the country and this is interesting process yeah involving uh, local people with the participants of the Fanadoc and the children very enthusiastic to to learn about the other culture as well. And for the participant itself, I think there is a, a very deep uh, uh, contemplation. Yeah. They do uh, measurement because the difficult of the terrain in the kampung, yeah, we, they have to, to deal with uh, buses, with the uh, uneasy condition of the sites. Yeah with uh, insects or uh, environmental climates, yeah, heat. So everything's accumulating uh, in the process of the drawing itself. And they, the, the participants takes any chance to choose the place to draw yeah, on sites. When do, this is the, the pencil process and uh, to to transfer yeah, to transfer the the initial transfer of the the houses into the drawings yeah and even the 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 front yard of the houses become uh, the uh, the site for the the drawing yeah and the local people because of the the unique characteristic of the kampung which is open so the local people then uh, sometimes interesting to know and asking the participants what they did and i think uh, this is interesting process uh, involving the the local with uh, this this uh, uh, fanadoc and change the people mind about the value of the their their heritage yeah sometimes they think the building is uh, old fashions and not interesting but when they see uh, foreigner and other people from other place coming and make the drawings and sometimes they they curious what happened why this building should be drawn and and they they didn't know what is the exact uh, uh, result of this yeah but after this they they know of course yeah but when this process happened they curious about why these old buildings which is according to them is old and not good yeah being being drawn yeah so this is part of the 
process uh, people uh, local people mindset and this is the uh, the owner of the one of the houses Pak Saudi and he witnessed the process how the student <laughs> uh, draw his house outside and inside and he very carefully observe yeah, one by one what the student did and he very proud uh, we we choose this house as uh, to to record uh, uh, his house because uh, this house experienced flooding and when the flood coming it's almost 30 centimeter from the this wooden floor this is stretch house but the when the flood coming it's uh, uh, about 30 centimeter from the, the floor and when we do this uh, around two months ago the flood uh, uh, struck this this kampung and you see uh, the the furniture and the, the things is not in uh, order yeah a bit a bit chaos so but we try to keep this as it is yeah and this is the process from reality to pencil and then make an outline texture and setting yeah uh, and i think the student uh, should understand it's not is uh, it's not easy process uh, but when do participants things they cannot make a drawing but when they involve in the process and they succeed in in finishing the drawing because more uh, all our Fernando camp camp uh, uh, consisted of the new new participants, yeah, and only a few uh, veterans, yeah. So I think it's it's interesting. And the other uh, important things about Fernando after drawings, it's we see it through the eye of everyday life, yeah. And this is Pak Saudi house, which is uh, hidden behind the the thicks of the greenery. Yeah, I think I like this uh, house, and and we interact with the the owner. And this is Pak Saudi, his wife, and these people actually very very clever, very smart people, and they they are. Uh, teacher and pensioners from tin mining company. So uh, many owners of these houses is previously worked in tin mining company. Yeah. And after they got uh, retirement and they stay in these old wooden houses. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, we, we learn a lot from uh, the archive. To understand the space and how the space uh, changed, yeah. And this is uh, Muntok in 1930 when the river still in good conditions, and on the right hand side in 2019 when the river is uh, because of the tin mining, yeah, process and it's destroy uh, the environmental uh, quality at that time. And this is one of the uh, the drawings of the Banka veterans uh, from the first house. This is uh, Bapak Saudi house. You see, the plan is not truly rectangle. Yeah, it's a bit trapezium. Yeah, and at this time, we we just asking why why it's happened. Yeah, it's normally it should be rectangle, but it's a bit. Angle. So, this is interesting. Uh, actually, because the flooding, 
yeah because the flooding we analyze and asking the our friends from uh, civil engineering and also Pak Saudi uh, why this plan change and I think it's important to when the revitalization happened after this, yeah and this is the kitchen yeah because of uh, the length of the house we have to separate between the the main house and the kitchen but these two drawings should be uh, together yeah the the main house located at the front and the kitchen located at the back and similar when we draw this there is difficulty between two uh, banka veteran because the the drawing is not precise yeah so there is a conflict <laughs> discussion be between these two uh, uh, banka uh, fernando veteran when make they make this yeah and i think this is interesting uh, why this happened yeah so because uh, this kitchen made from brick yeah and and uh, the the main house made from wood so this is the uh, and the kitchen still on its position yeah when the flood coming the kitchen still in its position but yeah the uh, the wooden house the main house then move when the flooding struck the the flow of flood, uh, water very powerful and it makes the the main building a bit move yeah especially the front so this is the uh, uh, our analysis about what this happened yeah and the typology of the house of the Malay house is they have staircase at the front and the front the gallery become the public area and the private area located uh, at the center of the houses yeah, where the the uh, the leaf uh, the 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 sleeping room and the the main gallery uh, the central gallery located yeah and eat on kitchen not on the main house yeah the the kitchen located separately and also the other important elements is the the well yeah and this is the process of uh, changing by uh, pa Saudi. Yeah? So after the the Fanadok, they revitalize uh, or they change the uh, uh, the the what what has been uh, broken before, and then based on our drawings yeah and this is the problem yeah uh, they change the pole of the uh, the wood yeah the column and add the a new structure made from bricks and it's then yeah? so because when the flood coming it will destroy the house yeah so the best solution is don't disrupt the the flow of the water yeah yeah so you see here there is a wall covering the underneath the floor yeah so this is dangerous yeah because when the flood coming the flow of water is powerful and it will destroy all the construction so I asked uh, the friend from civil engineering is the best solution let the flow of water flow naturally but we can add a new structure to make to return yeah the condition of the house move to the original position yeah and okay so this is some of the picture that we use and this is i think similar with uh bura fenadoc we did uh, on-site exhibitions to raise public awareness of the existence of kampung ulu 
and promote vernacular architecture as a form of art and of evoking sense of ownership towards historic architecture and the people's identity. And post Bangka one, we did digitalizations for to understand the vernacular tectonic. Yeah? And we make this based on our Fernando drawings. Yeah? And then try to reconstruct yeah, the three dimensional to understand the tectonic of the house. Yeah. And one by one, I think, yeah, until, so we get this uh, scenario yeah, for the house. Yeah. And we also uh, analyze the structure one by one based on the uh, analysis of the Fernando drawings and then how it's construct to each other. And different kind of constructions. Yeah. One pole, one beam, yeah. the roof have very many variations. I think this is important. How this building survived more than 100 years, even many flooding coming, but the house still stay but i'm not very sure if more flooding coming the house will stay but yeah so we have to make sure that it will not yeah we make the three dimensional from from this picture yeah and then the second house there 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 are two types of the houses and this is i think uh, the original uh the roof become uh, limas yeah, or prisms yeah mentok prism house or mentok limas house yeah and this is how drawing become uh, affected tools to communicate yeah for us and then we continue uh, post banka venadok one with the exhibitions yeah in and attract more than 1000 people to visit uh, in uh, faculty of engineering and ue library okay now we move to the second bangka fernando 2 uh, we did it last year in july and we have different object in chinese mayor house and uh, at the time we have 31 participants, most of them from Indonesia, and there are uh, a new uh, university, yeah? besides University of Indonesia, we also have Universitas Muhammadiyah Jakarta, Universitas Gunadarma, and from Thailand we have Asa Fernadox, and from Rangsit University, and uh, similar with the Bangka Fernadox one, we also being edited by a friend from Thailand, yeah. Sujit Sananwai, uh, and then uh, some people, yeah, I cannot mention one by one. And why we choose this Meyer house? Yeah, beside the aesthetic reasons of this very, very important building, uh, the building is in poor condition due to the difficulties in maintenance. Yeah, and at the back of the buildings, most of the building needs to be repaired. Yeah. So I think this is this building show its vernacularity today. Although this is in the past, maybe this is not vernacular architecture, but today for us, this is vernacular because of its looks and the conditions of the building, which is not become the main attention anymore. Yeah. And the other uniqueness characteristic of this uh, uh, stone house is it's a mix between Chinese, Malay, and European architecture. But the dominations of the representations of European architecture is very clear. Yeah? And it has uh, 16 Doric column on the front and 16 uh, Doric column for the rear veranda. Yeah. And the veranda become the main important uh, transitional space from outside to inside. Uh, 
for the colonial building. And the rear veranda not only function as the main gathering for the for the family, uh, but this mansion, the the rear veranda of this mansion being occupied by a family of the mayor. So you see the wooden uh, rooms on the left of this rear veranda, around ten or more than ten rooms, yeah, from wood, and it's become the sleeping room for the family of mayor. Besides the 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 main uh, sleeping room in the center of the building yeah and this house made in 18 around 18, 1860 yeah showing the imperial architecture in this architecture style and the the existence of chinese village is very crucial in the when we talk about Munto, yeah, because uh, the the tin mining uh, activity uh, attract labor yeah, from uh, overseas, mainly from China, yeah, and also from other uh, tin mining and cleft in the Southeast Asia. So, uh, Chinese settlement in uh, town of Munto become. Uh, significant area that uh, form the entire uh, uh, town itself and they become the uh, economic supporter yeah, supporting uh, society for the, the the town itself yeah and the characteristic of the houses is uh, mainly uh, sub houses courtyard house and because of muntok become the the classic capital city of the Bangka resident. So many mayor, uh, Chinese mayor, live in this town before uh, uh, the big uh, Chinese mayor. Yeah, the building, the house that we will become the uh, documented belongs to Chung Atiam. Yeah, the family of Chung Atiam, the mayor of Chung Atiam, who live in 19th century, but uh, he. He was not the first mayor, but he was, I think, the biggest, the richest uh, Chinese mayor in Bangka at the time. And this is uh, the typology of the uh, Chinese architecture. So uh, back to the Chinese mayor or Chung Atia mentions, yeah, and this is the fifth generations of the mayor house and the family spread to uh, many places many city in jakarta singapore and even to new york in new york so and this is pak hendra we, we call it kohendra and he was uh, become the the cater yeah, for the house today and it's it's difficult for him alone yeah to to maintain this very big house and he lived with his wife and with a supporter from donation from the visitor. Yeah. And this is the main area of the, 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 the houses itself, which is where is the Taipei Kung, yeah, uh, as the unique characteristic of the Chinese architecture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, don't. So the start of the process, we have we give lecture first to uh, the participants involving local uh, local resources and orientation to the site, contemplations for the participant to understand the site first, how the tin mining and how the Chinese society and how the network of uh, the tin mining, yeah become the uh, influence uh, the form of the the city itself yeah. and this is our best camp we we are lucky because we being su getting support from tin mining company and we can use the guest house of the uh, tin tin company as the best camp we do not live in the 
uh, local people house because I think we the number of us is a bit <laughs> high 31 so we don't want to disturb the local people so and fortunately the tin company give us these houses we have we got three houses to be used and we use this as a uh, coordination yeah, meeting every day to 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 review the process of the drawings yeah. and this is uh, the the block plan of the houses uh, the houses itself is i think bigger than this side plan yeah because the front is here yeah uh, sorry the front still belongs to the land still belongs to a uh, mayor and the back yard still belongs to mayor so the mayor have land from the river to the front yeah? and the main house is very big and from the outside it's not represent chinese architecture but from the inside we can feel the chinese characteristic yeah but when we go when we move further to the back or to the rear we can see a different but on the same courtyard that we think on the chinese architecture yeah. and this is similar with the first process we're making zero line and measurements and this is because of the the height of the buildings yeah and it's not easy yeah so uh to to it's not easy to measure yeah so only not all the the houses can be measured yeah only a few and we have to respect the owner because not all the rooms can be shown to us so in this case we learn something that's uh uh, the room itself not open but maybe sometimes uh, we will we will be allowed to, to see the room uh, which is cannot be shown to us today uh, at, at this time yeah and this is the process of the layouting and uh, how to draw uh, which one uh, who draw this how who draw this uh, plan so a lot of discussion lay in when we did this layouting and how to make the draw fit into the paper. Yeah. And this is the process of pencil outlining showing the back of the houses. Uh, it, this is done by Iqbal. Yeah. And I think, and this is quite interesting because not many Chinese houses have this kind of feature yeah they are aqua i think this is aquarium yeah uh, with ornamented in uh, neoclassical style yeah and this is the texture process after me making outline and this is the texture process and this is the uh, when uh, the shadow process uh, put into the drawing so it makes the drawing more life yeah so uh i think this is you know and this is i think very beautiful drawing drawn by uh chanawe from thailand showing the the taipekung uh, uh for the owner to worship and a lot of uh chinese letters being put on the on the walls uh, above the doors and it's there's a meaning i think and some showing the the ownerships the status of the mayor as the important person in in southeast asia yeah and this is the plan that cannot be completed yeah, as i mentioned before because we restricted enter into the room and this is the strategy to draw it's only one room that can be uh, entered so uh, and this is this is the the front yeah and this is the the rear the main yeah uh, the taipekung located at the center and there are uh, 12 rooms 12 sleeping rooms in this main building and 
the the male area located on the south and the female room located on the north and this is the environmental section yeah for the house itself not really show the the chinese architecture from the layout yeah but we see different yeah, uh, characteristic okay so this is the the front facades yeah they are uh, on the left and right hands the the statue of lion yeah and the the right hand is male lion and the left the left one is female yeah so it means that this is not and uh, this is uh, the the male uh, show the the position to toward the south and the female lion so the position toward the north and there are uh, 16 column yeah and to enter the main room we have three doors yeah and the doors for the uh, owner should be on the right yeah and the doors for guests or visitors should be on the left yeah and this is the the rear facade yeah different from uh front facade which is open the rear facade is a bit uh closed because of the there is a uh, the the sleeping rooms the wooden sleeping rooms located along the the rear uh, terrace or the rear veranda yeah you see the wooded uh, sleeping uh, room yeah and okay and the interesting thing about this house is it has two uh, prism roof yeah two uh, uh, atap limas yeah dua atap limas yeah. yang disatukan yeah being united uh, not not one roof yeah uh, I think because of uh, the compositions and also uh, the the stability of the roof structure, yeah, make this uh, building to be divided into two roof because the size of the plan is too big, and I think it's 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 uh, uh, the the mason, yeah, atau carpentry make this roof become uh, two roof prof kemas excuse me bro yeah okay i will just we'll have, show yeah. we have uh, a.m. Really. okay and this is the result of the the drawings i have to speed up okay and this is the studio and we draw the exhibition we did yeah, on set exhibition some event field trip and we do uh exhibition in the Chinese temple in December 2019 and it attract uh, many visitors to see and we did also lectures in Taiwan and in Leiden and this is the last one yeah, Fenadoc during COVID so we cannot do Fenadoc so we have a webinar a few months ago and we also create a, a fundraising for the homeowner of the uh, Fenadoc. And this is the last one that we did solo Fenadoc because we cannot make a Fenadoc in large number of people. And uh, the object is very simple, not the house, but we choose the door or the window. Yeah, we have three people involved in solo Fenadoc in Kampung Krangan, traditional uh, Bekasi architecture in from September to December. Okay, and next year, I think this is uh, we plan to have uh, Lampung Fenadox, yeah, but we do not know. And this is the conclusions that Fenadox architecture is a complete, complete set of a narrative of the past, present, and future of our cultural identity. The Fenadox drawings is the right tool to increase people's awareness of the decaying and forgotten vernacular architecture. However, documenting vernacular architectures is not enough, so we offer Fenadoc drawings as guidelines and references for future conservation of vernacular architectures. 
And I just would like to show to the student about the, okay. And for the students, new students, this is the tools instrument that many Fenadoc uh, veteran use during the process of uh, making drawing in Fenadoc. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Kemas, uh, for presenting us the wonderful uh, drawings uh, examples uh, from the uh, Muntok uh, Bangka uh, Fernador activities in the recent years. Yeah, as well as also mentioning uh, some other related activities about these uh, methods and techniques, and explaining us uh, more in the uh, techniques and the initial steps of drawing and you also mentioned about the tools and equipment required uh, for the user and uh, the drawers yeah especially will be useful for the students so uh prop Kemas, i have wrap up about three questions especially for you because uh, Julie Nichols have already answered uh, the uh, questions uh, directed uh, to her. Uh, and also Darren Fong helped us to answer some questions. So I will address uh, some questions from Aisha Naufal and Ibadur Rahman Mustafa. Yeah. These questions are for you, uh, Prof. Emas. Uh, the first question is for from Aisha. Uh, she would like to uh, ask about is vernacular architecture possible other than in residential uh, buildings, for example, like uh, public space, uh, temples, etc. And the second question uh, from Naufal. Since the Fernadoc intends to encourage the homeowners and villagers to appreciate the valuable assets, how the Fernadoc change the way they see their heritage or uh, their own uh, living home? And uh, the last question, I think I'm, I'm just uh, 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 describing all uh, questions. Yeah, from Kemas, uh, from Ibadur yeah. Rahman. Uh, he's interested in the village segmentation in Muntok. Why was and is the village separated into Malay, European, and Chinese uh, ethnicity in the first place? And why it keeps going until now? Thank you. And that's all I think what you can answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Musab. Yeah. Okay, for the first questions, whether uh, is there possibility that we talk vernacular architecture, not only residential building? Yeah, the answer is yes. So because the term vernacular architecture is not limited only for uh, residential building. Yeah, It can be any kind of structure that has been uh, uh, appropriate to to be uh, recognized as vernacular. Even, for instance, the bridge. Yeah, the bridge. It it can be from the point of view architecture. The bridge maybe it's not important, but as a part of vernacular structure. Yeah, it's it's possible. We talk about wooden bridge, which is uh, or uh standstill structure or temple like being uh, shown by uh, uh julie about the 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 mining building yeah so it's not only limited on the uh scope of residential yeah yeah as as long as uh, the building uh so I like to use the term vernacularity. Yeah, it's a kind of paradigm. Yeah, paradigm of a building that show its vernacular characteristic. It's it's different from traditional. Yeah, because uh, the term traditional also have a, a intersect with vernacular uh, terminology. But traditional architecture is more focused on the 
uh, the 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 transfer ya yeah, the transfer of knowledge from one generation to the next generation uh, about the continuity ya yeah. so traditional focus of the continuity but vernacular is not uh, only on that but vernacular show the 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 characteristic of being uh, oppressed being uh, the uh, local yeah or the simple way to say that vernacular architecture is the architecture which is designed not by formal architects yeah but by local people by people who are not being recognized in the mainstream of architectural professions yeah so so any kind of structure that show this uh, characteristic i think it's can be uh, include as uh, vernacular architecture okay yeah thank you sir okay and the second question from nofal about the influence of fenadoc to to maintain or to for the owner of the uh, heritage uh, and how they sustain yeah the building i think this is a important and significant question that i think during the process of making or fenadoc that how fenadoc can give more a benefit for the local people yeah so with the banca fenadoc one we experiments and we continue the drawing with try to analyze uh, how the process of uh, changing the process of destruction of the kampung happened because of the environmental disaster so i think uh, we need a lot of experts we need a lot of things after the process of fenadoc that involving the government itself in fighting uh, and and show to the the government that uh, and work with government to to save the area because uh, the area it's not only uh, belongs to the local people there, but it's it's will influence the formations of the old city the old area the historic area so when we get lost the malay kampung then uh, the old historic area of muntok will not the same again so why we think uh, the malay kampung is very important to be kept and uh, to be safe because of uh, yeah it's it's show the not only it so the unique characteristic of the the town itself but uh, because this is about the city the society yeah so fenadoc also talk about a uh, concern about the society that being uh, part of the process of documentations yeah so we put the the local people not as the object but as part of the process the subject the most important uh uh the most important uh, uh people yeah in this process yeah so from our uh, experience we uh we also heard about the unsatisfaction yeah from the local people towards the government yeah, about uh, the attention to the area but I think it's nil it's still in the process yeah in this process to to make uh, the, the the change and how make the kampung ulu become uh, uh, government uh, priority one of the government priority to to be regenerate to be revitalized yeah, in the future uh no foul it's Okay. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Kemas, and also Julie as well. Uh, uh, I just okay. uh, learned how the Fernando changed the way yeah. of people see. Thank you. And okay. And for the last question, I forget the last question. Uh, about the segregation. 
Uh, oh, segregation. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. This is interesting questions. That okay. Yeah, the segregations already happen. Yeah, yeah. Because of this is this is Muntok is colonial town. Yeah, Muntok is colonial town, and this is the very small town which is not very uh, improve a lot, and people still live. Some people still live traditionally in urban kampung, and uh, it's not like Jakarta. It's not like uh, 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 Canberra or Adelaide. Yeah, it's not like uh, uh, Denpasar, but it's very small town and small number of people, and the everyday life is very calm. Yeah. Uh, it is why that's not uh, since colonial era the the structure of the city not changed a lot not changed too much and then uh, since 2000s yeah after the reformation era that uh, there is the heritage yeah uh, movement yeah and there is the the increased awareness about the the importance of cultural heritage in indonesia and even in muntok some of the local people and and also my dissertations is about Muntok and we uh, we have a, a consensus about the future of this town and then we see cultural heritage become one of the important key factor to for the sustainability of the area so uh, we learn from uh, the archive the history about the characteristic and then uh, in 2013 uh, there is a, a, a study for the zonations making a historic area of the old town of Muntok yeah so from the study we recognize there is a I think three or four enclave exists until today yeah but in everyday life this enclave is not separated to each other yeah the the, the social interaction is not uh, segregated like in the colonial era yeah because uh, the intermediate between malay and chinese happened quite a lot and the symbol of the unity can be seen from the chinese temple and the mosque which is located next to each other in Muntok. So the intermarriage between Malay and, and European in the past and Malay and Chinese what happened a lot in, in, in Bangka, especially in Muntok. Yeah, because of the history of the tin mining itself. And I think uh, from the process, we recognize this unique characteristic and put it into the, the cluster. Yeah, so this is the conceptual uh, uh, not in the, uh, the 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 division of cluster. What I saw today is not on on the reality. So I would like to. Uh, this is not the one that like in the colonial era, but this is uh, showing the uh, the conceptual framework to revitalize the old town of Muntok as part of the process of. Uh, town revitalization. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, I agree with you that it seemed to me there's a segregation, but today in reality, there is no segregation at all. Okay. Hope that helps uh, answering the questions uh, for Ibadur Rahman. And I think we've reached uh, our end for this uh, webinar event. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Julie Nichols and Prof. Kemas for your uh, wonderful uh, presentations and uh, explanations about the Fernando activities, uh, experiences in the respective countries. And for all the participants, I would like to invite you to open your uh, camera video for our last documentations.
Dr. Julie, uh, is there any final remarks from you, perhaps after hearing and listening to Prof. Kema's lecture? Something to say? Sure, I, I think there is quite a lot of crossover actually between not obviously the cultural context, but the circumstances around colonization and cultural diversity in, you know, um, Banco um, and, and in Barra in many circumstances. And Barra is also really small scale town as well. So I thought, yeah, I thought it was really interesting and I really love your outfits, Prof Kemas. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I thought it was, yeah, it was the beautiful drawings, like absolutely beautiful with the amount of detail it was really lovely to see them again on, on the screen. So thank you very much. But I think, yes, I think it's there's a lot of similarity. Yeah. OK, so for all participants, I would like to take the screenshot for this uh, meeting. Uh, so on my cue now, uh, please, everyone, face uh, to the camera and smile, prepare to smile on my cue. <laughs> yeah. OK, ready? Yeah. So here we go. One, two, three, smile. Great. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, there's another page of the meeting, uh, so bear with me for a second. Yeah, again, for one more. One, two, three, smile. Yeah, done. Thank you, Musab. And yeah. I would like to thank you for Julie Nichols. Very, very wonderful presentation, Darren Wong all the participants, international Fernandoc veterans, Banca Fernandoc veterans, all the students, and my friends, Pak Punto, <laughs> uh, and other guests, uh, uh, Pak MTJ. Yeah. Thank you for uh, attending this webinar. And I think uh, a lot of, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. students, I think yeah, it's, it's good uh, for uh, the must, students and but yeah. must, I think, I think uh, until until your batch yeah uh, from 19, 1986 or 1985 or uh, 1984 even until 89 uh, 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 we we I remember that uh, we had that uh, uh, measuring yeah measuring the 